Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology, and first daily Mormon history podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. Who was the first woman ordained in the community of Christ following the 1984 revelation? It turns out that a good friend of mine, Paul's wife, Rena, was the woman. So she passed away earlier this year, but we've got lots of pictures, and Paul's going to share some tender memories of not only the prejudice she faced as a woman, but the prejudice she faced as a woman of color. So you won't want to miss this conversation, and Paul's going to share some very tender feelings uh, about this amazing woman, Rena Dwarf. You won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Well, let me go back to my wife's story because it ties in here. Okay. <clears throat> let me get choked up here a bit, too. But she came to the United States under the direction to love the people of Zion. She did the best she could with that, and she was discriminated against because she was a person of color. So she had to drink from the colored people's fountain. Oh, really? To go to the colored people's bathroom. Because she was Tahitian? She was dark-skinned, yes. Yeah. And her family was dark-skinned people. She was one of the lighter-skinned people of her family, but nonetheless, they were they, they dark-skinned people. When I, in 1969, approached the three different ministers to ask for counseling regarding marriage, all three of them, church appointees, said, don't get married, cross-cultural marriages never work. And we found one that said, yes, I'll marry you. <laughs> and he did, that was Reed Holmes. And our marriage only lasted 52 and a half years. Wow. And it has been a marvelous blessing to have five decades with an angel. She had to face that uh, criticism of having the wrong color of skin. Some people have told her even that there's no room in Zion for people of color. Mm. That to me was dreadfully painful. Our kids all have Tahitian names and she was chastised for not giving them names like Bill and Sue, but who wants to get a Bill and who wants to be sued? <laughs> Our kids all have names that are meaningful and they're Tahitian names. Inano Joy is a joy flower, Hayata is love light, Tehani is a beloved lady, who, and, and, and Almana. These, these four beautiful girls and we were warned that our kids would be spotted. And Hamana Alexandra, the person who loves God and helps people, is our pastor. And our son, Tehao Jean-Paul, a gentleman of peace. And they all live up to their names, beautiful people. And yet we were discouraged for marriage because, well, what would people think of your children? The people are proud of our kids and so are we. Until we can learn to embrace those people that criticize us. We don't belong in Zion, I believe. And Rena profoundly taught that message and she embraced those people that criticized her. We had some that came to her funeral who had voted against her for being, her being ordained and it took 30 years plus for her to love them from a distance before they would come around to even pay respects at her funeral. Wow. But if you love people, it's just amazing what can happen. The healings happen. And I saw that with her. She came out of a family of healers and, and navigators. But the, the fact that people respond so favorably to being loved, even if they are discriminating and, and harsh and angry, to be able to, to feel the impact of someone who's willing to love you anyway, it's such a profound thing. I believe that's what the cause of Zion is all about, and that's something we need to learn to embrace. And things like the battles that, uh, that, uh, and the Mormon War, the massacres otherwise, until we can learn to, to repent, to be sorry, to pay the reparations, to make it so that uh, we can be tra treated equitably. There's no reason why all people should not be seen as children of God. That makes us brother equals, brothers and sisters, all the same family. Rena did such a beautiful job of illustrating that. We had the first celebration of her life after two weeks after she passed, and that was on Zoom. And here the, 
the people from around the world, from Africa, from Asia, from Europe, from all across the Pacific and the Americas had nice things to say about her because she spoke to them in her own language because she wanted to learn people's language so she could speak Chinese, Arabic, Portuguese, Japanese, Russian. Oh, and she grew up speaking Tahitian and French mm -hmm. and came to the United States to learn English and majored in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a delight to escort her to an international conference and be introduced uh, by someone who was so widely loved and appreciated. Wow. Well, let's stick with Rena for a little bit because okay. that was. Well, let, let, let me go on with that one then, because okay. there was a, there was a there was a lady on that Zoom from Tahiti who wanted to speak, and in French she explained that she'd had a baby 20 years ago who had congestion or her, her lungs were full of fluids and she couldn't breathe when she was born. The doctor, she said, put tubes down her nose, into her lungs, to try to help her respire, and it failed. And so the doctors went to make a death certificate out, came back. Rena had come by and prayed for that little girl. Mm. And somehow the little girl had pulled those tubes out of her nose, was coughing out the lungs from her, stuff from her lungs. She's now a healthy 20-year-old woman. Oh, wow. Those people who think that women should not be ministers have another thing coming. <laughs> it was our honor to be ministers together and to be able to share in praying for people, mm -hmm. to share testimonies, to share sermons. It was such a, we had 30 some years of that beautiful experience and I can't help but recommend it to the LDS Church and all the others that don't allow women to be ministers because one of the greatest blessings of my life was to be able to share in ministry with that beautiful angel. Yeah. Well, and I didn't realize that uh, that when I met her last summer, she was the first woman ordained in the community of Christ. Is that right? Well, there were four women ordained that first night on November 17 in 1985. Rena and I were ordained together, and I think she was the first woman in the RLDS church to be ordained. We went to Tahiti two years later. Now, let me back up on that because when the pastor came to tell us that Rena was, or, that we were both called to be elders, Rena, Rena had, Rena had received a patriarchal blessing from her father 10 years earlier. And in that he reminded her to pray always for your children, pray for your husband, pray for your family. But with all the discrimination, she got angry. She felt picked on, she felt discriminated against People were, uh, it, it had gotten pretty serious. And she stopped praying. And our two little girls, who would have been probably three and four at this time, got sick. And I was a teacher, trying to make it on $5,000 a year. We didn't have health care. And Rena had not been praying, and so she didn't feel like we should call for the elders. And our girls were sick, running a high fever. They went into convulsions. And Rena, I saw her put her hands, one on each leg of those two little girls, and bowed her head to pray to God to ask forgiveness. It was a pretty long prayer. <laughs> she told me afterwards it was a long prayer because she had a lot to, to ask forgiveness for, because she had stopped praying. She had given up on that faith. But here for her girls, recognizing that they needed that blessing and she asked God to forgive her and if he would heal those girls she would serve him. Ten years later when the call came for her to be a first woman called she had already given her answer to the Lord. Her mother had spoken just two months before in the conference in Tahiti in opposition to women being ordained. Oh really? So when that when the uh, pastor came Rena asked him to wait because she wanted to call home and talk with her parents knowing that uh, she had, a, had to deal with her mother. We called that night and her father answered the phone. So she was gratified because he would be the easier one to talk with. Her mother came out of the heritage of the warriors and her father came out of the very calm people, the, the people who would say, Hari mai tama'a, come and eat with us and we'll make friends and maybe you'll marry into our family and uh, we'll live happily ever after. Her mother's side had been going out to 
collect slaves and uh, people to eat. <laughs> and it was just very, I mean, quite a sandwich that she grew up in. And her mother didn't think that women ought to be asserting themselves because, after all, the tra Polynesian tradition was a very patriarchal one. Mm -hmm. Women had to stay away from the marae, from the temple sites. And so Rena's father passed the phone to her mother. So Rena explained to her, and her mother said, Mama Tutu said, hey, hey, hey. Rena knew she didn't understand. That was yes, yes, yes. So she explained it again. Mama Tutu said, hey, 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 and passed the phone to Papa. Rena explained to Papa, and he said, hey, hey, hey. Rena was a bit confounded, but her parents had received spiritual witness that this was right. Oh. And they said, yes, yes, yes. The Lord calls you to be a minister. So two, year, two years later, we went to Tahiti, and I think it was the first time any woman had occupied any pulpit in Polynesia. But she was asked to speak to a conference of 1,200 people. And at that conference, there were a whole bunch of people who opposed the idea of women becoming ministers. And I remember she was asked to speak at Tahitian, but that's the language she left behind as a child. Here she came back, even though she had all these other languages, now she's supposed to put together a sermon in Tahitian. What a challenge. But uh, she consulted with her father. And uh, I remember I was holding our, our, our baby boy at the time uh, when she went forward, and I urged her to be led by the Spirit, by the Good Spirit. She thanked the people who were mentors, her Sunday school teachers, and those that had fed her, because in Tahiti, when you feed a child, you've adopted that child. Uh -huh. And when we arrived in Tahiti, she warned me, Papa, you've got to be prepared to, to, to hug and kiss my mamas and papas. <laughs> and at 5 o'clock in the morning, the airport, airport at Fa'a, ah, here were a dozen mamas and papas for me to hug and kiss. And this Iowa farm boy had a, had a cultural immersion that was just amazing. And it's a, it's a so much better these way. These are polygamy do. mamas and papas, though. Right, right. These are, these are people that had fed her, had, had cared for her, who felt like that she was like their daughter, and and here and her, she was friends, basically. Right. Well, and and in Tahiti, it's a it's a generational system, so that all the all the sisters are going to be recognized by their children as mamas. Oh wow! And the fathers as papas, and so for a given generation. They're all brothers and sisters. And then you get to the grandparents. And so it, it's just a delightful, well, it means that the children always have parents available. Nobody is an orphan. Oh, wow. It's a, it's a so much better system in many respects. Anyway, she she then proceeded to to thank the people that had, that had cared for her. <sighs> she told them about the house that her father had built. He had gone down to the wharf and taken the discarded crates, and she as a little girl had helped to hold a crate on either hand on the bicycle, and he pedaled him up the valley to where he had a site for a house. And there they ripped the crates apart, resawed the boards, pulled nails, and he built a house for his wife and ten kids. Wow. She was seven, and she pulled nails, but she pointed out to the people in that uh, auditorium that uh, if you lean up against the wall of that house, you get splinters. And suddenly there were chuckles all across for people that had been there. <laughs> he painted it blue, and she thought it was a beautiful house and loved it. But it had a little bit of jeopardy. But then she held up a crooked nail and said, we are all crooked nails, and we need to be straightened so God can use us in building up his kingdom. Oh. Just like my papa, I had to straighten the nails that came out of the, those crates so that they could be used to build his house. So it is that God wants us to be straightened in our lives so that we can work for him in his kingdom. And across that body, you can just feel the transformation as people recognize that sure enough, through the Spirit of God, we're being ministered to by a woman. The following Sunday, we shared a joint sermon, and in the week that followed that, the calls for 34 women were processed to be ordained. Oh, wow. In well, Tahiti. In Tahiti. And one of those was uh, Mareva Arnaud, who in 2013 was called to be an apostle. Oh. And when Mareva was ordained, after the prayer, she came down and grabbed Rena first and hugged and kissed her and said, thank you for being the pathfinder. In 2015, Lana, I forgot her last name, was elected in Polynesia to be the senator to represent the Polynesians in the assembly in France. 
this little wife of mine who basically wanted to love and take care of her own family to bring a greater equity to the world in Polynesia. That's really cool. So tell me about something about the community of Christ. Um, when you're called to be an elder, I know a lot of elders are the pastor of the congregation. Is that why you and your wife were called to be elders at the same time? Was one of you the pastor of the congregation? No. Or? No. no, neither of us ever became pastor. Oh, okay. <laughs> that fun? Our daughter is. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, our daughter's been our pastor for the last couple of years. Our youngest daughter. Okay. Um, spotted child. <laughs> 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 well, that is, God spotted her and recognized that she was someone qualified to be a pastor. Now, Rena and I served as ministers, as co-ministers, but that was more frequently in things like hospital ministry where we would find out about somebody that was ill and we'd go pray for them. Uh, so many times for a lady to be ill, if it's a, if it's a woman minister that's able to come and, and empathize, identify with, counsel with, well, let me give you an example. It was February of 2016, I believe, and I had put on the church sign listen to his whisper. And the next day, I got a phone call from Edna Tebbe. Edna Tebbe is from the Cameroons in Africa. She and her husband, God love, living in Independence, Missouri. Edna Tebbe called because the Tebbies had come to visit Rena when she was in the hospital getting her new kidney. The Tebbies knew that Rena had been through nine years of dialysis, they knew that she'd been through the cancer. Edna Tebbe's principal in the school that she taught in in Kansas City, or maybe it was Independence, her principal was in the hospital. She had one, one foot cut off. She had a serious case of diabetes. Mm. She had cancer. She was giving up on life. So she asked if Rena would come and pray for her. We went, that was Monday, we went that evening. And when we walked into the room, Rena saw the lady in the bed and called her by name, Missy, a Chinese girl in Tahiti had been adopted by American missionaries 50 years earlier. Those missionaries were at the church where Rena attended and Rena took care of that baby. And here 50 years later, she walks into the hospital room asked to pray for this little girl without knowing that, that without the lady from from Cameroons knowing that they were connected. Oh wow. <laughs> How does this happen? And Missy not only was able to get the benefit of prayer but the counsel because Rena had been through some of those same problems. And Rena said, don't let them take that other leg off unless you really think that it's that's right. Because she was scheduled to have the other leg removed. Mm. And Missy listened to Rena. She, two weeks later, she invited us over to her house for dinner. Look at the profound transformation that occurs with a woman's ministry when we allow that kind of blessing to be forthcoming. Missy lived another two years, and Missy and Rena were real sisters. I mean, <laughs> what, a, what a remarkable bind to be reunited by a lady from the Cameroons in Kansas City when they first met in Tahiti 50 years ago. Uh, and then we got reunited with the Condits, the, the missionary family that, that had adopted Missy as well. What a, what a small, intimate, marvelous world that God has created and allows us to participate in it. And if only we could open our eyes to a little bit more faith, a little bit more prayer. Well, the fourth, the, the third celebration of Rena's life was at the end of our world conference. And the kids determined to put together a feast for the people at New Arena. And so they got the basement of the stone church and laid out the tables with coverings and put about 500 pictures of Rena on there for the people to take home. I knew that I was called upon to speak to that group that night. This was going to include the Polynesian delegation, the French delegation, people from around the world at New Arena and what do you say to all these people whose lives have been touched by your loving wife? 
that morning, two months to the day, April 28th, 2023, you know, whispered in my right ear at six o'clock in the morning, woke me up and said, tell them, don't forget to love each other. Tell them, don't forget to love each other. So fundamentally and profoundly the message of her life. And just look how much better our lives are when we don't forget to love each other. And if we do forget to love each other, if we go back and make things right and try to get to love each other again, look how much better our lives are. But that fundamental message that she left is the message that I want to relay and I feel is the call of my life now until I get to be with her again. Not everybody gets the privilege of living with an angel like I did. And she came back to see me. <laughs> I've been so blessed. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with archaeologist Paul DeBarth. In our next conversation, we're going to talk a little bit about the musket fire that Paul has found, but it's only available to newsletter subscribers. So subscribe to our free newsletter at gospeltangents.com slash newsletter, and I'll send you a secret link to the final part of our conversation. Yes, we found both the rifle and pistol balls, so very good evidence of, of the uh, battle that, that was conducted there. Some probably close to 500 uh, Missouri regulars came in, and, and there were probably as many as 30 people in Hans Mill at the time. The hamlet was pretty small, was scattering a, maybe a dozen buildings. And yes, there was a significant military incident that occurred there, and sadly it was a, really a massacre for those 17 people. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, subscribe on either Patreon or at gospeltangents.com. For just $5 a month, you can hear the entire audio uninterrupted. On our $10 tier, if you'd like to see the whole video, you can see that uh, either on youtube.com slash gospeltangents, or I've got a special Facebook group devoted for uh, full videos. So subscribe at gospeltangents.com and uh, sign up for just $10 a month. For $20 a month, if you'd like to get some bonus content, uh, maybe some of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor, you can sign up for that. And then if you'd like to talk to me for $100 a month, we'll, we'll do a monthly phone call on something like Zoom, and you can ask me anything you want. So thanks again. Also, don't forget about the merch, mugs, T-shirts, um, hats, things like that. I'm trying to get the ties up there. Hopefully I can get up, up there. And uh, thanks again for watching Gospel Tangents. And click here for some more videos.